Welcome to the show for sinners and sufferers. My name is Cody. We are continuing our series through 1 Timothy, and today we are talking about the church is the household of God, our responsibilities to each other in that household, as well as to social service. And we're doing this from reading 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, which says this, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own households and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Earlier in chapter 3 of this letter, Paul told Timothy that the church is the household of God. And now he is establishing for Timothy some principles how that the members of this household are to treat one another and to, to take care of each other as a household, and especially how those in positions of authority are to correct others in the family. And the, the first thing he says is, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. And a number of other English translations say, do not rebuke harshly or do not sharply rebuke an older man. And I think that's a better. It's, a, it's an important clarification to make when translating because Paul has already charged Timothy to rebuke false teachers earlier in this letter. And even later in the same chapter in verse 20, Paul will tell Timothy, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. From a, a surface level English reading, this might seem contradictory. Are we supposed to rebuke false teachers or not? If the false teachers are older men, can we not rebuke the false teachers? But when Paul says rebuke, these are two different words in the Greek. When he says rebuke in verse 20, to, to rebuke those who continue in sin, the word he uses there is elenko, which means to convict, to expose and correct. Well, the word in this verse regarding, regarding older men is epipleso, which is to inflict blows upon. It's a, a beating down, demeaning rebuke. Well, the rebuke given in love can be life-giving and, and helpful. When a rebuke corrects and encourages, it realigns the recipient to godly living but the type of rebuke that Paul speaks against here is one that is, is merely beating down. It's not convicting. It's just condemning. It doesn't say, let me correct you. It says, you're dumb and you should feel bad. It's not a rebuke out of love, but it's just bullying. So Paul says, when you correct older men, don't beat them down and degrade them, but encourage them as you would your own father that it is strongly appeal and urge and exhort them with the respect do your own father. Professor Denny Burke says it's, the, it's like the difference between drawing a sword or a scalpel. Because a, a scalpel may still hurt. It will cause discomfort. It doesn't feel good to be cut open for surgery, but a scalpel is wielded with intent clearly to help and not to harm. It's not a, a weapon of war and destruction, but a precise surgical tool. Correcting an, an older man aggressively in an attacking way as with a sword is more likely to cause him to be beat down and destroyed, or even to draw his own sword and start swinging back. If correction is the goal, gentleness is the tool of choice. Proverbs 15.1 tells us a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Paul, go, Paul goes on to say, in, a, in the case of younger men, it's, and it's echoing the same statement, do not beat down younger men, do not condemn them, but encourage them as brothers. Now with the same kind of respect, but respect to do is, is equals. 
not speaking down to them, but as, as peers with honesty and patience, seeking to maintain peace with this member of your household, seeking to, to have each other's backs as brothers do. But probably we, we speak to our brothers a little more openly and bluntly than we would speak to a stranger. It's preserving relationship, caring, but as equals, as peers, very open. In the case of older women in the church, there's a, a similar type of respect due to the older men, but there's also an innate tendency, at least in men with dignity, to deal with our mothers gently, protectively. And this is how we as Christians should treat, uh, and especially when correcting and, and encouraging the older women in our church as our own mothers. Paul will go on to speak of the, the mothers in the church as the, the mothers of the church. It, Paul very highly regards Timothy's mother. In, in Romans, he refers to, to Rufus's mother as being a mother to, to Paul himself as well. Paul is very serious and very protective of the role of, of church mothers and their position in the community. Finally, Paul says with younger women, encourage them as sisters in all purity. That is with a, a sense of appropriateness and dignity, not seeking any, any personal purpose in that relationship, not confusing counseling and encouraging with courting, but, but guarding them and their purity. There's a reason why, why elsewhere Paul will say, allow the older women to teach the younger women and the older men to teach the, the younger men. And it's to, to guard against the, these confused relationships and the tendency of younger persons to want to push those lines sometimes. Paul then goes on to talk about something that we might seem, or we might think is kind of irrelevant. It might seem kind of distant to many of us now in its specifics, though it, it would have been of great concern in the, in the early church and the principles at play are still key to how we do church today. And that is the care of widows within the church. Widows and orphans were some of the most vulnerable people in that society, people who had little to no hope of income, no way to work their way up and establish themselves. These were people seen as lesser, like lower class citizens, lesser people. And you didn't have to specify poor or impoverished widows and orphans because their poverty is safely assumed in that culture. So in the early church, caring for these people became a, a primary outworking of religious faith. Almost immediately, we see an axe that the church takes to distributing food to, window, to widows. Um, James writes in, in chapter 1, verse 27 of James, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. God desires for his people to care for the most vulnerable, those in the most need, those who the world would not condemn us for seeing as lower than us and unworthy of our care and attention. Because this is what Christ exemplifies in his life and death. If God would stoop so low to deliver us who did not at all deserve it, but he gives us hope and life and salvation, then we have no right to deny others our care and support. So Paul tells us to care for those who are truly widows, that is those who are, are truly alone, truly despondent, and he identifies uh, a familial obligation, first within blood families. He says, if you have a, a parent or grandparent who's a widow, show godliness by making some return. That, that is some repayment back for the years, the time, the care, the expense, the faithful parents spend on their children to ch seek to make some return to give back to our parents. Paul says this pleases God. But if anyone does not provide for their family, especially their immediate family, they have denied the faith. That is, if you're so self-absorbed to not even care for your family, you likely have no understanding of the gospel. You do not truly know God or you're denying his transformative work in your life. But Paul also defines true widows 
as yes, those truly desolate, poor and in need, but also as those who believe in God and are dedicated to prayer. Those women who are true believers as proven by their actions. And he contrasts this with women who live in simple pleasures. That is women who are, are self-indulgent, who care for nobody but themselves about her own comfort and pleasure, which Paul says, these women are already dead while they yet live because she is not a, a true disciple of Christ. She is not a true widow and she is not part of the household of God and as such is not eligible for church support. And this is where things maybe get a little tough, a little controversial. Paul goes on in the next few verses in verses 7 to 16 to outline the qualifications for a widow to be eligible for church support. He says, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows." as followers of Christ, our obligation to social service is first to our own families, then to our church family, before those outside of our household in the world. And many churches will be quick to volunteer at a soup kitchen or hand out sandwiches on the street or, or something similar to, to look to do social work outside of their own congregation while members of their own church family are struggling and suffering. And this probably sounds harsh or even blasphemous to modern North American reasoning. How dare you be so exclusive that you would show favoritism to your family before helping a stranger who rejects God? But scripture is clear. Our obligations are first to our family, then to the church before the community that is outside of the household of God. A church who neglects the needs of those in their congregation is failing to live in the faith, to live pleasing to God, regardless of how much social service they do outside of the family. Beyond specifying that these widows are, are members of the household, Paul also establishes guards against abuse of the, of the system. The church is to support those, support those women in need who are truly too old to remarry or to find other means to take care of themselves as well as those who have proven themselves to be faithful members of the household of God. In our service, we are to take care that we are not enabling sinful living. What Paul describes as idlers and gossips is basically those living off the system, who are not and have not cared for a family or worked for their keep, but expect to be given a free ride through life. It's not unloving or unchristlike for us as Christians to discern who is really in need and who is just trying to take advantage of us. Jesus says, be wise as serpents and innocent and do as doves. But most of the time, Christians just act dumb as turkeys when it comes to those abusing the kindness and charity of Christians. Often the best way we can help someone in our family who is in need is not to blindly throw money at them, but to encourage and enable them and to, and to make way for them to live faithfully, to do the work that is appointed to them. Then once we see the faithful, faithfulness, we make up the difference to ensure their needs are met. Then out of a healthy church family where everyone's needs are met, will a church be best equipped to reach out into the community around them to invite others to come in? John 13, 35, Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. A lot of Christian so social work is merely ensuring lost men are, are comfortable on their path to destruction. 
But the best thing we can do is to invite them into the community of hope and grace that we have into the household of God, to tell them the truth about the salvation freely offered them. A famous Christian quote, uh, sometimes attributed to D.T. Niles, sometimes attributed to D.L. Moody. It's, it's a Christian mystery, but there's a quote that says, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And this is a, a great description. But let us be sure that we are not merely pointing them to gluten, but to the bread of life. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, or snide remarks. You can leave a comment on YouTube or send a message on Instagram at Sinner Suffers. And while you're at it, why not like the video on YouTube or rate and review on whatever podcast app you prefer that prefer that all helps more people find this content. You can find all our links on sinnersandsuffers.com. Look forward to hearing from you soon, and I will see you later.